Our last model today will be the soil erosion control model. In the soil erosion co uh, control model, we must understand that uh, soil erosion, particularly in terrestrial ecosystem, is a major global environmental problem and significantly impacts on environmental quality and social economy. The effect of soil erosion go far beyond the loss of fertile land and include increased pollution, sedimentation in streams and rivers. As a result, waterways are prone to clogging, which causes decline in fish and other species. Furthermore, degraded land can often hold less water, which can worsen flooding. That is according to a report by Revival in 2018. Ecosystems such as forests and redlands help to stabilize soils, reduce erosion, such that the vegetative cover shelters soils from the force of rain by intercepting rainfall while roots help to maintain the soil structure. The costs associated with erosion include the loss of soil productivity, damage to roads and other infrastructure, filling into ditches and reservoirs, reduced water quality and impacts on fish population. By protecting soil from water erosion, Terrestrial ecosystems supply human beings with the soil erosion control service, one of the fundamental ecosystem services that ensure human welfare. Soil erosion is therefore one of the most significant soil degradation processes that underpins the importance of soil conservation. Illustrated there is a soil erosion control. You can see if it is a tree which stands for the forest ecosystem, how the roots work uh, to actually uh, hold the soil so that uh, erosion will not, will not take place. And then also you see the grasses, which uh, significantly play a bigger role even than the forest in terms of reducing uh, soil erosion. The next picture there showcases uh, bare land where the levels of uh, soil erosion are very high. You can see um, it's a picture showcasing uh, a rainy season and uh, there are actually significant uh, soil erosion that can be visualized from that photo. So what are the biophysical assessment or biophysical indicators that we need to consider when it comes to the soil erosion control model? The model considers differences in mass of soil lost in an actual land cover scenario and a no cover scenario. Remember we said the color tool basically is built based on degradation aspects and that's why comparing the two scenarios is very key. And therefore this forms the key indicator for the biophysical assessment. The model raster input considers factors applied in the revised universal soil loss equation, RASO. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this uh, equation. It's an empirical model that is used to quantify the potential soil loss per unit area for a given period of time from the landscape. The model uh, presents a scenario-based approach for the assessment of the soil erosion control ecosystem service. Two important scenarios are modeled using the RASO equation. For example, uh, what we mean in this case is that uh, soil loss from the landscape with the current or actual land use land cover and a soil loss from the landscape with an assumed no cover or no vegetation in the landscape. Therefore, a comparison of the current state with soil loss from an assumed no cover state expresses the quantified value of the vegetation in the landscape with regard to soil erosion control as an ecosystem service. The process therefore allows for quantification of avoided soil loss as a subject of the presence of land cover in the ecosystem in question. To derive the RASO factors for the biophysical quantification, the following procedure can be adopted. Uh, Reynard and others in 1991 presented the RASO equation as it showcased there where A represents the long-term average annual soil loss in tons per hectare. The R is the rainfall and, ra and uh, runoff factor by geographic uh, location. A formula for the derivation of the R factor has been presented there. You can be able to visualize it. Those that have had an opportunity to work with the RASO equation, I'm sure are familiar with these uh, factors. The K is the soil erodibility factor. It is average soil loss in tons per hectare. It's a measure of susceptibility of soil particles to detachment and transport by rainfall and runoff. Texture is a principal factor affecting K. According to Whitner and Smith in 1978, soil type becomes less erodible with a de decrease in silt fraction regardless of weather, the corresponding increase in, in the sand fraction or the clay fraction. I do not want to get into the de details of the extraction of this uh, factors, but this information has already been provided for in the guide for you to be able to follow up and know how to either silt, clay, and sand. That is what determines the K factor and the erodibility of the soils. And then the LS factor is a combined factor to account for the length and the steepness of the slope. 
Both the length and the st steepness of the land slope sustainability affect the rate of soil erosion. The longer the slope, the greater the volume of runoff. The steeper the slope, the greater the velocity. A formula for the extraction of the LS has been uh, displayed there. And you can actually follow up in the Colwood uh, tool guide to be able to know how to extract uh, the LS factor. An illustration of the forest cover soil erosion control has been uh, demonstrated there. Like I said, the grass plays a, a bigger role compared to forest, but because we'll be running the forest, uh, the forest uh, uh, part of the models, the sub model within the soil erosion control, I felt it's good to just look at uh, how the root zone enable the percolation of the water and therefore slow down the movement of water. And the, in that case, also slowing down any soil erosion that could have taken place. Further, the P factor is a support practice factor. It reflects the effect of management practices at the farm level that reduce the amount and the rate of water runoff and thus reduce the amount of uh, erosion. The P factor represents the ratio of soil loss by support practices, and this is considered to be a constant factor for each unique support management uh, practice. For example, improved tillage, soil based rotations, fertility treatment, and greater quantities of crop residue. Uh, left in the field are known to reduce actually uh, soil erosion and frequently provide the major control in farmers' fields. And then we have the C factor. It's a combined factor to account for the effects of vegetation cover and management practices. And this is where the forest, the shrubland, the grassland the ecosystem come in. And therefore, they are modified depending on the applicable land cover characteristics in order to be able to spatially differentiate the various land cover species and can canopy cover densities and flow vegetation and in the ability to actually slow down uh, soil erosion. So here it is where in the model we are manipulating the C factor because we, are, we have said it's a scenario based approach where we manipulate the C factor and have a no vegetation cover to be able to visualize under cover and a no cover vegetation, how much soil are we likely to be avoiding in terms of loss so that we can be able to model and actualize uh, the value that would accrue to forests or rangelands, that means shrublands and uh, grasslands. For the soil erosion control model, when you look at the economic assessment, is the avoided cost method and the replacement cost method. Uh, which evaluation techniques for the monetization of the quantified ecosystem? So when we look at the economic assessment of soil erosion control service in this model, we focus on the cost of decreased soil productivity through the loss of soil nutrients. Number two, we look at the increased treatment of water in downstream as a result of uh, water pollution, and in most cases, the uh, levels of uh, sedimentation. We thirdly look at the decline in reservoir capacities as a result of sedimentation. Remember we said when, uh, when we look at the water storage, when we look at flood control capabilities, we are looking at uh, declining reservoir capacities to hold enough water as a result of sedimentation. And this is, these are some of the factors that we are also looking at under soil erosion control model. The economic valuation methods of the soil erosion control therefore is examined from an on-site erosion retention by a certain land cover as an aspect of replacement cost from on-site or off-site soil loss, which is directly attributed to any anticipated uh, losses. For example, nutrients loss, which result in a decline in agricultural productivity. The value of the ecosystem service would be calculated uh, from the cost in card if the nutrients in the soil were to be replaced. You find that uh, a lot where in, in soils where a lot of soil erosion takes place, the soil, soil nutrients have been, uh, uh, have been um, destroyed and in most cases you find that you have to go back to the shop to buy fertilizers to increase the soil fertility in order to replenish that soil to support uh, crop production so in summary what are we trying to say that the model for the valuation of soil erosion is an ecosystem service from landscapes due to the presence of vegetation cover it considers ecosystem service to be equivalent to the value of soil loss controlled by applicable land cover which is economically equated to avoided soil erosion cost calculated from the replacement cost and the differential cost as a result of no cover so what are the data requirements there are quite a number 19 of them we look at the the p factor the p the p factor like i've described it the c factor the ls factor the r and the k factor and the actual land cover be it a forest be it a shrubland be it a grassland 
those needs to be extracted based on the formulas that we have provided. Then we have the P, the C, the LS, the R, and the K factor, which are assumed as a no-cover landscape. If data is unavailable, a raster with a pixel value of 1 can be used. For this uh, particular P and C factor, the rest will have to be extracted from the particular landscape uh, under no-cover. Then you need the vector file of the landscape, it's required. You need to understand the soil bulk density in tons per cubic meter. You need to have the nutrient conversion factors so that you can be able to convert uh, the soil nutrients within the soil that has been lost into the nutrients that need now to be valued based on the market price. Then you need the total volume of water that could have uh, incurred the issues of uh, water quality. And the unit uh, cost of that water in the applicable currency, you need the unit cost of the nutrients. Here we are saying we are comparing the nutrients in the soil to the fertilizers, either organic or inorganic in the market. The unit cost of water treatment as a result of poor water quality, the landscape area, and finally the input raster pixel areas. So what are the specific uh, technical consideration or guidelines that you need when you're working with this model? That the R, K, L, S, and C factors for both the actual land cover scenario and no cover scenario are mandatory requisite data sets. If data on the P factor is unavailable in either scenario, a raster with a pixel value of one can be used. Remember we said P factor is the management practices. The C factor raster for the no cover scenario is represented by a raster of the landscape with a raster value of one because we are said we are assuming a scenario of no cover. So if it was a forest, we are going to assume a scenario of no cover and uh, uh, have a C factor with a value of one to depict uh, the documented C factor for bare lands. Further, in the preparation of the vector files, there are things to note that the vector file represents the landscape and assessment in the shapefile format. The attribute table of the vector file must have a column titled uh, area in hectares, depicting the area of landscape in hectares. We can now finally go to the model demonstration so that we can be able to run this uh, particular model and visualize our output. So this is how the soil erosion uh, control model should be. Uh, when you scroll up, you can be able to see all the factors that are required to be entered. I've preloaded them because it takes quite uh, some time uh, loading these uh, data sets. So we have the R factor and alternative land cover. This is the current scenario in the field. So for the first uh, R factor, K factor, LSC, and P factor is the scenario that is currently in the field. Then an assumed no cover scenario where it would be a bare land. So for, for example, if the government institution or the private sector or even the stakeholders, the local stakeholders feel that uh, this forest should be removed uh, to pave way for another bigger project that has more revenue or uh, maybe is of more importance to them, then uh, we assume a no cover landscape because now it means that whatever is replacing it, if it's not a vegetation cover, then we have to assume a bare land scenario so that we can be able to calculate and see how much soil loss will we be losing and what is this value that we are losing as a result of uh, converting the current land cover into something else alternatively you can have uh, where the current land cover is degraded and therefore we want to see uh, based on the levels of uh, degradation whether the grasses or the forest or the shrublands depending on how they have been depleted compared to a bare land scenario you'd also want to see uh, what happens the next data set would be the landscape feature this is a shape file that you need to load for the landscape in question that is being investigated for soil erosion. Then we have the soil back density, which needs to be calculated uh, from the field survey, nutrient conversion factor. This is very key because uh, it enables you to know the amount of nutrients that are likely to be in the soil that is being lost. So a soil sample should be carried out to investigate the levels of NPK, Y, nitrogen, uh, potassium, and uh, phosphorus, because uh, the retailing uh, Fertilizers in the market usually are sold in levels of N, P, and K. And so it's important to investigate and know how much for that uh, small portion of soil so that you can be able to calculate for the entire uh, tonnage of soil that is lost so that you can be able to account for the loss in land productivity. Then the next thing would be the unit cost of water. We have uh, three aspects that we are looking at here. The land productivity, 
the water quality and the sedimentation effects so that using these two we can able to gauge uh, what is the role of any land cover in terms of soil erosion control so we input the unit cost of water there and the total volume of water that is likely to have been affected by uh, issues of soil erosion and this has to come from the field survey where you identify the particular uh, water source and how uh, and be able to establish the unit cost of that water and the volumes that have been affected. The value of nutrients, like I've said, we are going to use the retailing market prices for either organic or inorganic fertilizers, water treatment cost. This is the cost that is being incurred to clean this water as a result of pollution from soil erosion or as a result of uh, sedimentation. Pixel area would be based on the satellite imagery that is being used for this valuation and has been used to extract the factors that we have discussed above. And then the output folder is where you'd want to store your final output to visualize it in a QGIS or ArcGIS, whatever GIS software that you have. And now that these data sets have been loaded, uh, we'll run the model, uh, give it time to run. So quite a number of uh, data inputs there. So finally, the model has finished. So let's visualize our soil erosion uh, output. I uh, will do this in ArcGIS. We can also appreciate another software. We've been using uh, QGIS all through these lessons. So we load our data set, the soil erosion uh, output. You can see it there. We can try to at least uh, change the colors based on the attribute table. So the first uh, figure there that gives us um, The first figure there that gives us 21,400 is from moderate forest. We have the no data. We can put that in uh, black because it's not within our area of uh, assessment. So we have uh, forest, moderate forest in green. The next one is open shrubland. We can put a brown color. Then we have uh, closed shrublands, it's almost uh, similar. There's a bit lighter color. Then we have uh, sparse forest, it's a lighter green. Then we have uh, grasslands, normally in uh, the magenta color. Then we have uh, cropland. Normally the FAO uses the pink color to represent uh, cropland. Uh, we have water. We can just uh, visualize it in the color of water. The value is zero. It does not play any role in uh, soil erosion. Then we have the built up areas normally visualized in red color. And then finally we have the bare lands. Balance, we can put them in uh, white or a color that is close to white. So we have our uh, we have our soil erosion uh, output there. We can be able to see that uh, in areas that uh, we have moderate forest, the value is higher. Like I said in this calculation, uh, we are looking at the tonnage of soil that is being prevented from being lost by a land cover, whether it's a forest, a shrubland or a grassland, then subtracting it from a no cover scenario that would have a higher tonnage of soil being lost, then what we get from um, the subtraction or the change that is between these two gives us what we are calling the avoided cost that would have been incurred if this soil would have been lost and affected land productivity, if soil would have been lost and affected uh, water pollution, if there is any uh, water source that is next to this landscape, if also there is any issue of sedimentation uh, as a result of uh, the, the whole of this soil being lost and being moved uh, 
uh, downstream to a place where there's a wetland or even a river channel. So once we do that, then we can be able to appreciate where the soil loss is. Uh, for example, let's have uh, 10,000 uh, tons of soil being lost and uh, no cover. And then the under forest, we have uh, 1,000 tons that can only be lost because the movement uh, is being slowed down by this uh, C factor. So when you do the subtraction, you realize that uh, the soil that could have been lost as a result of uh, no cover or uh, as a result of uh, a bare land situation, then would have been uh, 10,000 tons minus 1,000. You get around 9,000. So this 9,000 is what uh, we value based on land productivity. We value based on the pollution cost and treatment cost of water. And we value based on the treatment cost as a result of sedimentation. So you find for forest, moderate forest, the, the value is high. For the grasslands, the shrublands, uh, the sparse forest, you realize the, the, the values are significantly higher because they play a very key role in uh, reducing soil erosion. And that is it from us uh, for today. We welcome any questions and answer sessions on the three models that we have discussed today. All our models uh, are basically uh, almost 100% the process based, the soil erosion, the water storage, and the terrestrial product. Let us uh, have key discussions to see are there any areas we can improve? Uh, what do these kind of statistics uh, invoke? For example, when you look at this soil erosion, the key statistics here invoke that uh, vegetation cover is very important. Otherwise, if you have scenarios of bare land and built up areas, um, Possibilities of losing higher soil erosion, possibilities of having uh, clogging of drainage systems, segmentation of uh, water sources, loss of land productivity that is key not only for cropland but also for biodiversity. So those kind of uh, statistics are those that you sit down with key decision makers to tell them if they are planning to actually remove a very significant uh, ecosystem that plays all these uh, significant ecosystem functions that lead to significant ecosystem services, then you can be able to see how uh, operating under this ecosystem because there's a very important need, very important economic need, how it can be done. What are the trade-offs that can be done? Because land degradation neutrality under UNCCD calls for trade-offs so that we can be able to utilize our ecosystems sustainably. We may want to protect, but at times when we protect, uh, we may not uh, be able to provide certain services that are required by the population. So we have to come at a point where we ask ourselves, how do we sustainably utilize our ecosystem, ensuring that uh, we are slowing down on degradation? If we can move to the point of zero degradation, it will be very good. If there's a point that we can be able to utilize and allow for rejuvenation of the ecosystem to continue providing these ecosystem services, this is the point where we don't want to be. Thank you so much for listening.